Hello, I'm Professor Sims, and in this video, I will continue discussing microbial genetics, specifically polymerase chain reaction, DNA fingerprinting, and Singer dideoxynucleotide sequencing. This is the last in a series of 10 lab sessions held as part of my online laboratory for the Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you're a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. In this unit, we will learn the concepts of PCR, DNA fingerprinting, and Sanger sequencing, understand the differences between in vivo and in vitro DNA replication, learn the steps involved in performing PCR and DNA sequencing, and I will show you how to use the BLAST database to query DNA sequences and how to properly report and cite DNA sequence data. Most methods of DNA analysis require large amounts of DNA. The polymerase chain reaction permits rapid amplification in the number of copies of DNA for further analysis. PCR is an in vitro laboratory technique that takes advantage of the natural process of DNA replication. So we discussed in lab nine how in vivo DNA replication is done and the enzymes involved in that. And in lab 10, we're gonna be talking about how that is done artificially in the lab. So basically, Basically, you have three major steps. You have separating the strands, making primers, and adding new nucleotides to the parent strands. In vivo, helicase and topoisomerase are the enzymes that help with the strand separation. In vivo, the primase makes the primers, and in vivo, DNA polymerase is used to add new nucleotides. Now, in vitro, instead of using enzymes to separate the DNA strands, we use heat. Remember that you have phosphodiester bonds that are holding the sugar phosphate backbone together, and those are covalent bonds, which are relatively strong. And then you have hydrogen bonds holding the nucleic acids in the middle together, and hydrogen bonds are relatively weak. So what you can do is you can actually denature those hydrogen bonds. You can break those hydrogen bonds using heat. You can heat it to specific temperatures. It's usually somewhere between 90 and 96 degrees, where it's hot enough that it actually breaks those hydrogen bonds but it's not so hot that it will break the phosphodiester bonds. So you can use heat to separate the strands and the phosphodiester backbone, the sugar phosphate backbone, remains intact. As for making primers, you can actually synthesize primers in a lab. If you have a target region of DNA, you can synthesize a, a single strand of adenines, thymines, cytosines, and guanines that are complementary to the strand of DNA that you are targeting. So that is done artificially. And as far as adding nucleotides to the parent strand, for that, we use TAC polymerase. TAC polymerase, T-A-Q, the name comes from the bacteria from which it was isolated. The bacteria name was Thermus aquaticus. Thermus aquaticus lives in hot springs. So it has DNA polymerase, and it has DNA polymerase that can tolerate high temperatures. And we need DNA polymerase that can tolerate high temperatures because of this step here, where you're heating the DNA in order to separate the strands. PCR occurs over multiple cycles, each containing three steps denaturing, annealing, and extension. Machines called thermocyclers are used for PCR. These machines can be programmed to cycle through these three steps multiple times, and it's usually somewhere between 30 and 40 times, or well, 20 to 40, but usually it's closer to 30. The first step, the double-stranded template DNA containing the target sequences is denatured at approximately 94 degrees. The high temperature required to physically separate the DNA strand is the reason that the heat-stable TAC polymerase is required, right? Then the temperature is then lowered to approximately 48 degrees. It's really a range. It depends on what your primers are. They have different annealing temperatures. So it's usually somewhere between 45 and 65 degrees, the annealing temperature. And this allows the DNA primers complementary to the ends of the target sequence to anneal. And that really just means that they stick together. And they anneal to the temperate, template strands with one primer annealing to each strand. And finally, the temperature is raised to about 72 degrees. And that's almost universal, that 72 degrees. Because that's the optimal temperature for the activity of the heat stable to tack polymerase. 
and that allows for the addition of nucleotides to the primer using the target as a template. So denaturing is when the two strands split apart. Annealing is where the primer adds. Extension is where the new nucleotides are added. And this cycles over and over and over and over simply by cycling through different temperatures. And you have your reaction mixture. And so you have water. This is just some salt. You have your primers. You have your enzyme. And you have your free nucleotides. And those cycle through over and over and over again. And each cycle doubles the number of double-stranded target DNA copies. And typically your PCR protocol is going to include, like I said, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 cycles, 20 to 40 cycles. And that allows for amplification of a single target sequence to billions of copies of that target sequence. And this all happens within the time span of about an hour to an hour and a half. For experiment one, you'll complete a simulation of PCR at this link here. Note that I'll note all of the procedural steps and relate them to the table that we discussed in the previous slide. Here is a quick clip of what the simulation will look like. And I do want to note here that in order to start the interactive portion of the simulation, it tells you to, to move something from here to here. I had trouble with this, so I'm mentioning it. You have to click and hold the click down as you drag it over. If you don't do that, then nothing's going to happen and you're going to get frustrated like I did. While PCR is great for making more DNA, it can't tell you the actual nucleotide bases that are contained in the DNA or the order in which those nucleotides appear. So if you need to know the sequence of the DNA, for that, you're going to need to perform a sequencing technique. This particular sequencing technique, Sanger dideoxynucleotide sequencing, it's also called the chain termination method. It was developed by Frederick Sanger in 1972. This method involves amplification of a single-stranded DNA template with the use of a primer to initiate synthesis of a complementary strand. The polymerase, the top polymerase, a mix of four regular deoxynucleotides, also known as DNTPs and a small proportion of dideoxynucleotides, also known as DDNTPs. Each are labeled with a flag or a fluorescent tag. And the technique is very similar to PCR except for the addition of these DDNTPs, which have a hydroxyl group that has been removed from the site at which the next nu nucleotide would normally attach. Every time a DDNTP is randomly incorporated into the growing complementary strand, it terminates the reaction for that particular strand. And this results in multiple short strands of DNA that are each terminated at different points during replication. And when the reaction mixture is subjected to electrophoresis, the multiple newly replicated DNA strands form a ladder of differing sizes. The DNTPs are, are labeled with what is known as a flag. Again, a flag is short for fluorescent tag. And this is a small molecule that is attached at the three prime site where the hydroxyl group was missing. The flag is artificially added in its place and it allows for the determination of the sequence. That is, because the dideoxynucleotides are labeled and they fluoresce, at different wavelengths, so they're different colors. And depending on which nucleotide it is, you can add a flag that is a different color, and then a laser at the end is used to detect which color is located at which size or which position. Okay, so 
I know this is confusing, so let me explain it a different way. If you understand PCR, you understand Sanger sequencing because Sanger sequencing is just PCR with a different ingredient thrown in. You're using the same types of enzymes to do all the replication. It's the same principle. It's, it's cycling through different temperatures. And you even have the same reaction mixture except dideoxynucleotides added, including in addition to the regular deoxynucleotides, okay? And what happens is, is you have this reaction mixture and it's cycling through the temperatures and you have nucleotides that are being added and every so often, instead of the regular deoxynucleotide, you'll have this dideoxynucleotide that adds. And when the dideoxynucleotide adds, the next nucleotides can't add anymore. So the reaction stops. And not only does the reaction stop, but that dideoxynucleotide glows. And in that way, you can tell which base it was that it stopped at because all of these fluorescent tags are going to have different colors. So in this example, you have adenine, the dideoxyadenine is going to be red, dideoxycytosine is going to be blue, guanine is green, and thymine is yellow. So you have fragments of all different sizes at the end of this and they're all going to glow different colors and in that way you can figure out which base is at which position based on their size and what color they glow. Here you can see the structure of a dideoxynucleotide and it, how similar it is to a regular deoxynucleotide, but there's an OH hydroxyl group missing at the three prime carbon. And this is why when a dideoxynucleotide is incorporated into the DNA strand as it's being synthesized, it stops the reaction because there's, there's no OH group here. There's no place for the next nucleotide to bond. And in fact, instead of having that OH group here, there's a little molecule that's been added that glows under fluorescent light and that's the flag. Again, the process looks very similar to PCR in that the reaction mixture is essentially identical except for the addition of the dideoxynucleotides. Also, there's an added step of the electrophoresis being read by a laser. The laser can see the sizes and the colors of the DNA fragments and it compiles them into what is called a chromatogram. The chromatogram shows where the dideoxynucleotides added, how many times they added at that location, and which dideoxynucleotide it was that added, right? So you'll ultimately end up with a sequence. The chromatogram has these curves that show you how many times that particular nucleotide added to that particular location. So that gives you some idea of how reliable this data is. And then up here at the top, you actually have the sequence. This here is A, A, T, G, C, C, A, A, T, A, C, G, A, C, T, C, A, C, T, A, T, and so on. That's the sequence. So for experiment two, you're going to perform Sanger sequencing via the simulation found here at this link. Use your observations to answer the guided questions in the report for template. Then for experiment three, you're going to query a DNA sequence using the BLAST database. Once you have a sequence, the next logical step is going to be to query it using the BLAST database. BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool, and it's basically the Google of DNA sequencing and molecular studies in general. And here are the steps really quickly. I'm going to take you through all of them individually. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to go to the website. You're going to choose the nucleotide BLAST program on the home page. You'll copy and paste your DNA sequence that I have provided for you into the enter query sequence box. You're going to choose the nucleotide collection database. You're going to optimize your program selection for BLAST in, in for nucleotide. Then you're going to click the BLAST button and then you're going to choose the best match to report your findings. So what you're doing is, is you're taking a sequence from an unknown species. You're going to plug it into this database to see if you can find a species in there that is known that matches your sequence. And that way you can identify your sequence. And BLAST is a huge database. It's been being used by scientists all over the world since 1990. So if it's not in there, you're not going to find it. It might have a new species. It's possible. All right, so this is what it looks like. This is the home page. There are more than one database. You want to make sure that you're choosing the nucleotide database. You'll click there. Then you'll see a page that looks something like this. This is your enter query sequence box. 
It's asking for an accession number, GI, or FASTA sequence. What you have been provided with in your procedure is the FASTA sequence. So you just have to copy the whole sequence and paste it right here. Then you're going to go to the database and make sure that it says nucleotide collection in RNT. Then you're going to go to the optimized for somewhat similar bases, blast in, and then you click blast. And then you are going to have like a splash page here that is giving you updates. Depending on the speed of your internet, this might take a few seconds, it might take a few minutes. And that's because Blast, like I said, it's huge. It's a huge database. And I don't, I'm telling you this because I don't want you to think that your computer froze if it takes a couple of minutes. Um, it's going to update the splash page every so often. We'll um, tell you how, how long it's going to be to the next update, okay? And usually it's, we're talking seconds, but it, it could be minutes. Then on the results page, you have a graphic summary here that kind of shows the similarities of your sequence to things that were in the database. Each line of this graph is a hit in the database, so it's going to show the top 20 matches. Usually the first match is the one that you want to go by. If you scroll down on this same page, you will have a textual representation of the same information that you see up here with a little bit more, some statistical data and things like that. So if you have the top match here, you know that you had 100% query coverage because the graph showed 100% query coverage. And it also is telling you that here, 100% query coverage. And you have an E value, a percent identity, and an accession number here. So if you see that this has the hyperlink, it's blue and it's underlined, and so is the accession number. If you want to, you can click through those things because it will tell you uh, who identified it, when, uh, what they were experimenting on, what they were working on. But um, yeah, somebody sequenced this, identified it, and submitted it to this database. So when we use BLAST to identify our unknown sequence, say we figure out that our sequence came from Klebsiella erogenes. Well, we can't just say that it matched to that species and that's that. No, no. We have to give credit to the author that uploaded that sequence. And the way that you do that is by reporting the accession number. So when you are reporting your BLAST findings, you want to make sure that you include the query coverage, the e-value, percent identity. So those are the statistical data. And then the accession number is giving credit to the person that uploaded that sequence to the database. And you also want to cite BLAST. The citation for BLAST is going to be included in your guidelines for reports. The full citation is in there. For your observations and interpretations, um, you want to be able to outline the similarities and differences of in vivo and in vitro DNA replication. You want to make sure that you know the similarities and differences between PCR and Sanger sequencing. And you want to make sure that you understand the specific information that you can get by performing any of these procedures. And what information does querying a sequence obtained from unknown specimen by a blast yield? Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.